Okay, we're going to resume our discussion of penetrating neck trauma. And previously we talked about the anatomy, and now we're going to talk about the management of penetrating neck trauma. And as with all emergency department patients, you should always start with IV O2 monitor. But in the trauma patient, uh, let's turn that IV into two IVs and let's make them two large bore IVs. So if you can get like a 16 or an 18 gauge in, and also, if it may be a good idea to avoid the side that the trauma's in. Let's say you put an IV in over here, and then the IV fluid goes in, and then there's venous injury here, it just all spills out anyway. So put it here and here, but try to avoid the side that has the trauma. Then we know the next step in our, the management of our trauma patient is the primary survey. So we want to make sure we get that done. And our primary survey is our A, B, C, D, E, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. And we know that with airway, we always also include C-spine considerations there. And after the primary survey comes the secondary survey and our workup. So let's look at each one of those in turn. So we'll start with airway. Does penetrating trauma to the neck automatically buy you an intubation? It might seem like that because you would think that uh, there's no way airway is not going to be damaged. However, there is the problem that if there's some clot there that is holding everything together and you stick a tube in there, or you muck around, that you dislodge that clot and they bleed out. So now we are thinking that we might want to do something called selective intubation, which means we're not going to intubate anybody. The people who are crashing, yeah, they need to be intubated. The people who are hypoxic, yes. The people whose airway you can see is damaged, yeah, go ahead and do it. The people who have an expanding hematoma, yeah, intubate those people. But the people who are sitting there and talking with you and uh, chatting with you and, and, they, and they're stable, well, then you might not have to. And if you don't have to, then don't do it just yet. Let's get some more information to see whether we need to do it or not. Now, another thing that you might take into account is if you are transferring this patient, maybe you're working in a small community hospital and someone comes in with their throat slashed uh, and they're talking to you and they're fine, but you've got to transfer them to the next trauma center, which is a good 20, 30 minute drive away in traffic. You might want to intubate those people because you don't want the ambulance drivers, the paramedics to have to do that en route. So then for our selective intubations, we do want to do it if they're unstable, if they're hypoxic, if they have an expanding hematoma, if you can see the airway and it's damaged, or if they need transfer. So what's the best way to intubate these people? Is it with a fiber optic scope, which are those long, uh, tubular, flexible, lighted fiber optic scopes that you could slide a tube over, and then using a camera and a light, you could wiggle your way into the airway. Well, the problem with this is that if you get just a little bit of blood on it, then you can't see anything anymore, and so it becomes useless. And chances are, with this penetrating neck trauma, you're going to get a little bit of blood on it. So fiber optic is not our best choice. What about uh, nasotracheal? That's where you blindly stick in a tube here and it eventually goes in here, and a lot of paramedics will, will do that. But the problem with this is, again, you don't know what's damaged in there. And you may have a basilar skull fracture, or you may have some other thing, and blindly passing this thing could cause more damage. So let's not do that either. So it turns out one of the best ways to do it is just direct laryngoscopy, which is to use the, uh, laryng the blade and the tube, and under direct visualization to place that tube. But let's talk about two other scenarios. Okay, and so here I've drawn your airway, so here's your thyroid cartilage, here's the cricoid cartilage, these are supposed to be the tracheal rings, that's your trachea, this here is the cricothyroid membrane. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the emergency medicine physicians go to airway when all hits the fan, and that's the emergency crike. And so that means we stick a tube, we have to cut through the cricothyroid membrane and stick a tube in there. So the first thing you have to do is you have to make a cut through here, and then you stick the tube right into that hole. Now, of course, I made it sound easy. It's not that easy, but that's our way that we can fix a, an, an airways is an emergency crike. The second thing that I wanted to talk about is if through the trauma you could actually see the trachea, right? 
And so now you got that there. So I would grab that thing with whatever you have handy. If you got a pair of needle drivers or a four or a hemostat or whatever, but grab that thing so you don't lose it. And then stick your endotracheal tube directly into there. Now this will be the easiest intubation you'll ever do because the airway is just staring at you. Now what about C-spine? Does a penetrating neck injury automatically get you into a C-collar? Not necessarily. If the patient is awake, conversant, and can uh, talk to you, then you don't necessarily have to put them into a C-collar. Now, of course, if the patient is comatose or is unstable, can't talk to you, or they have some sort of new neurologic deficit, then go for it. Some people say that, you know what? Uh, if you got shot through the neck, the damage is already done, and a C-collar is probably not going to help. So what about breathing? Now remember, airway is probably going to be your number one injury here because there's airway runs right through the neck. But in zone one of the neck, look what's there at the top of the lungs. So you may have a pneumothorax, maybe even a tension pneumothorax that you have to worry about. So for breathing, watch out for that. For circulation, remember, we already took care of that two large bore IVs, IV fluid. And we said to put those two large bore IVs, preferably not on the side that's got the injury. For disability, you want to know, is altered med are they altered? Do they have any neurologic injury? It's possible, right? Remember that zone one of the neck over here really includes the base of the skull, so they may have had penetration into the base of the skull and into the brain. So um, a, a good neuro exam is always is important. And if you think that they are in any impending danger of uh, becoming comatose, losing their airway, or herniating, take care of that. Finally, E. E is for exposure. That means to undress the patient, look for any uh, underlying injuries, and then you know recover them up. And obviously, if you see anything pulsatile coming up, don't you do want to stop that bleeding, but you don't want to go and clamp it because there's too many important things in there. You don't want to clamp a nerve or a vessel that's undamaged. So get a student, get a tech, get a somebody, and hold pressure directly on that wound. So this gets us through our primary survey now, right? Airway with C-spine, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Now let's talk quickly about our secondary survey. And the secondary survey is the history, and a commonly taught mnemonic for this is the AMPLE history, which stands for the allergies, medications, past medical, social, surgical, all that stuff, the time they had the last meal, and the events surrounding the injury, meaning the mechanism of this injury, which is very important. Secondly, we, the next part is the physical, and for neck injuries, we want to do a very uh, detailed physical exam, and that includes the stuff that we already talked about. We looked at that in the last video, and that I'm showing you again here, and that is all of this stuff that we want to look at to look for all the hard signs for injury of these. I'm not going to go through all of them again. You could look at them here, pause the video if you need to, but uh, we talked about them in the first video, but you want to do a good physical exam. So then this is our secondary survey. And the one point I want to make here is all of these things that we listed here, these are called hard signs. These are the hard signs of injury that are going to trigger uh, certain uh, going to the operating room. So let's now look at workup. So the workup for these injuries has changed recently. And it used to be that uh, it was based on the zones of the neck. And here I've drawn the zones again, zone 1, zone 2, and zone 3. And the workup was based on what exactly was in those zones and how likely it was that those things were going to be injured. So, for zone 1, what was in that zone? It's your lungs, it's your... Uh, and all the other uh, aerodigestive stuff and vas ves vessels. So these patients would get a chest x-ray to look at the lungs, a CT angiogram of the vessels to make sure those weren't injured, an EGD to look at the esophagus. You could also do a barium swallow, but you could do an EGD. And a bronch to look at the airway. Now zone 3, what's in there? Well, that's the airway, mainly the airway there. And of course the base of the head, so our work up here included a CT head, CT angio of the vessels, and direct laryngoscopy to look at that airway. And zone 2, well, there was too much stuff in here that could be damaged. So those patients all went to the operating room. And so this was the old way we used to do it. The new thing that we're finding is that there were a lot of people who went to the OR who didn't necessarily need to. 
So instead of sending everyone to the OR, we can do selective intervention. And what that means is if somebody has those hard signs, then they go straight to the OR. Now, if they don't have these hard signs and they're stable and they're talking to you and they're making sense and you don't see blood pulsing out and all those things that we listed on the hard signs thing, then you could do some testing. And our testing is the same as we had done previously. We're going to do the CT angio, we're going to do an EGD or a barium swallow, and we're going to do a bronch. And we're going to look for injury that way. And if we find nothing, then we watch them in the emergency department, maybe six to eight hours, for any injury that might develop. And so this is the new way that we're doing it. So I want to say two caveats. First is that this, this is only for injuries that cross the platysma. If it doesn't cross the platysma, you don't have to do all this. Secondly is talk to your surgeons in your hospital. Talk to the surgeons at your trauma center and see what they want to do. Maybe they don't feel comfortable with doing this selective intervention because that physical exam, it's pretty detailed. And if you don't get it right, there are some serious potential problems that can happen. So talk to them. And if they feel comfortable, you do the selective intervention. If, if you don't, maybe they want to take everyone to the OR. Then you can, that's still valid. You could still do that. You're going to have some negative uh, surgeries, but it's better than some dead patients. So that's it for our talk on penetrating neck trauma. And we went through here, through all the management that we would go through. If you have any questions, please leave me a comment or a message. And uh, I hope you have a good day. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.